All right, well, if you're stumbling in and don't know what you've gotten yourselves into, what we'll be talking about this time is uh, what it really takes to build a container platform, or uh, 10 things that we learned the hard way. All right, all right. Um, I'm Matt Butcher. I'm the platform architect at Deus. Um, my main area of responsibility at Deus is to sort of help define what the next generation of Deus is going to look like and also uh, what the next generation of Deus' uh, Deus's ecosystem tools are going to look like. Um, we are in the process of a major version shift from the 1x line of Deus to the 2x. And, uh, and I like to call this the great Kubernetes rebase because essentially what we're doing is rebuilding our platform on top of Kubernetes. So this is not a commercial for Deus, but I'm going to give you a little bit of introductory material right here up front so that it can kind of frame out for you all of the crazy things that have happened to us in the last year and a half. So, uh, so here's kind of our, our guiding set of philosophical principles. Uh, the first one is that microservices are kind of hot right now, right? Um, they, th this sort of component architecture inside of the cloud uh, has gained a lot of traction. Uh, you know, it started really with, uh, with places like Netflix telling us how they did it. Um, but it's a good model. And I've used it several places in the past and been really thrilled with the way it's worked. Containers uh, seem to be kind of the ideal vehicle for building these kinds of microservices. They help you kind of uh, constrain your way of thinking so that you start thinking in a microservices oriented <coughs> architecture. Um, and then uh, the, the final thing that we, we value quite a bit is, and I mentioned this yesterday in my two minutes, right? We are trying to build tools that help avoid the thrown over the wall problem where you have application developers who are working on their applications, and at some point they go, eh, it works on my laptop, and they throw it over the wall, and the DevOps guys, on the other hand, catch it and go, eh, this is not going to work in our production environment. Uh, so Heroku, you know, tried to tackle this problem, and we uh, originally felt that Heroku did a very, Heroku did do a very good job uh, on, on figuring out some of this, uh, easing the developer workflow. And Deus version one, was largely based on the idea that we should be able to provide the kind of developer, application developer experience that Heroku did, but in a way that gave DevOps and operations the ability to deploy onto whatever platform they actually wanted to, whether it was AWS or bare metal inside their firewall or whatever. We also bought in fairly early to the idea that Docker was the way to do things. And so with Deus v1, we tried to do Docker to the max. That was sort of the principle, right? as many things as we could put into Docker containers and run them, we did. So not only were we running the applications that you deploy into Deus as Docker containers, but we were running the components of Deus inside of Docker containers. At one time or another, I think we tried every single one. Uh, right now, etcd and fleet both live outside of it, and everything else lives inside of various containers. We also went the Go route. Um, I think that the original version of Deus was um, it was more Ruby-ish, because I think it was, uh, it was largely used Chef for the orchestration layer, but sort of outgrew that and, uh, and did some Python and then really settled in on Go as the language of choice. So most of Deus version one is in Go. Um, we, were, we were looking for flexibility for DevOps so that you could deploy on whatever platform you wanted. Uh, but one thing we decided to sort of punt on was, uh, was something Cloud Foundry decided they wanted to work on. Um, and that was services. That was providing like a database inside of the cluster that the applications could wire themselves up to, or a key value storage or something like that. And we sort of opted for the bring your own services kind of mentality and we focused more on the flexibility of the platform. And that ended up, the whole platform ended up being a big success. Uh, as we all know, the new hotness is only the new hotness for, a, you know, the length of time it takes for Miley Cyrus to put out an album, right? And then you've got to go on to something else. And, uh, and, and what was, what's really exciting about this space is that Docker was sort of the first part of what we think is going to be a major wave. And we think that we're still going way up the innovation curve on this wave, and there's a lot still to come. And the tooling that's surrounding containerized environments is getting really robust, really interesting, and I'm really excited about it. And so we switched focuses from V1 to V2, from doing sort of Heroku better to what if we turned the PaaS into a series of microservices that people could choose to run individual microservices if they wanted, 
or we would provide you know, sort of the official assemblage of services you would need in order to run the full out day as paths. So basically we were talking about breaking things out and then making each little component inside of day as far more robust. And we decided that where we went Docker to the max the first time, we're gonna keep all the Docker stuff, but we're gonna go Kubernetes to the max the second time. So we bought into that, we are working very hard on that stuff. And we'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, still, we, we, we evaluated our choice of Go, decided we made the right decision, we're carrying on with that, we're even trying to replace some of the few things that weren't Go with Go, even some of our shell script we are now replacing with Go. Uh, and we're taking the sort of building blocks mentality. We are about, I'm optimistic, right? Um, we're about 40% of the way into this. So a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about today are sort of lessons we learned from the early days of Deus on through, you know, the, some of this stuff is like two weeks old, right? We're still learning things the hard way, the wrong way, whichever way. So I'm gonna do sort of, you know, David Letterman-y style top 10 list of things that we learned the hard way. Um, number 10, say yes to object storage and you should probably say no to network file systems. I think I'm gonna actually offend both Flocker and Docker at the same conference. Uh, so, so, so this uh, here you've got a black cat in the black basket, white cat, and that's object storage. You can't stream a cat into a basket. The cat's either in the basket or not in the basket, right? Unless um, it's Schrodinger's, <laughs> unless it's Schrodinger's cat. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the things we really struggle with is we made the mistake in assuming that part of a successful platform, part of a successful PaaS-like platform, was to provide a file system storage system that everybody could use. And so we, we used Ceph. Uh, we got going into Ceph very deeply. We did a lot of very difficult engineering to get Ceph working. And then we found out sort of to our dismay that lots of people went, well, I don't really want to use Ceph. I'd rather use elastic block storage, or I'd rather use Gluster, or I'd rather, and, and and we're going, but wait, we put all this work into it. When we stepped back and looked at it, we had put the work in you know, partially for ourselves and partially for the people that deployed it, but we realized that we were sort of not really using it the way it should be used anyway. Largely, we just had chunks of data, backups, log blobs, stuff like that, that we needed somewhere to store. And we had bitten off this huge chunk, which is Ceph, to try and get it to work in our various cloud environments, and it was tedious and difficult. When we had the meeting where we went, what are we really using? We realized that object storage is a better model. We've got an object, we just need to put it somewhere and get some kind of handle back to it when we need it later on. So why, you know, sort of what, what are the key differences here and what, chose, what made us choose one way or over another? Uh, a big one is that object storage was largely defined by one company, Amazon, defined the S3 API, right? Uh, easy to use, resty kind of API. But everybody picked it up. Uh, Swift is, is S3 compatible. Uh, React CS is S3 compatible. Minio is S3 compatible. Ceph is S3 compatible. And we went, wait a minute. So we would have one API to use for all of our object storage kinds of needs. Or we could go the block storage route where everything is sort of roughly post 6 but you know, some of them will allow multi-reads and multi-writes. Some of them will allow only one writing host and all reading hosts. Some of them require only, and, and you know, rather than deal with the headache that is the sort of plethora of different implementations, we went, well, let's stick with the single S3 sort of model where we know exactly what we're working with and where we can plug in a whole bunch of different backends and assume that we're getting almost identical behaviors between them. All right, lesson number nine. Turtles all the way down, or the strange things that we do in the name of security. So part of the, one of the features of Deus One was that uh, we provided Heroku style build -based. So you push your source code up, it gets compiled somewhere on one of our servers, it gets bundled, into a, bundled with a Docker file, compiled into a container, pushed into a registry, and then deployed out as a Docker container in your, in your Deus cluster. Uh, the problem for us is that the code that gets pushed in is essentially untrusted code. So we wanted to come up with a solution. So just to, just to step back and take a quick look at Docker security, there is a fairly well-known, fairly well-understood set of security concerns around running Docker, right? We all kind of know these. You're sharing a kernel, 
you got seizures and things like that. We, we kind of understand that space. But we were worried more about the fact that we are actually building containers inside of containers. And, uh, and there, there are certain amounts of privileges you have to give the Docker system in order to be able to build a container. And we got to the point where we started to worry about how safe it really was uh, to allow people to upload untrusted code. Not even because they were malicious. Most of the deployments of Deus, you know, the code is vetted well before it's ever pushed into Deus by the group that's you know, maintaining it. But accidents could take down substantial portions of the cluster. And so security sort of became a fairly big deal to us as we started architecting V2. So we're sitting around one day. We got this crazy, crazy idea. What if we ran Docker inside of a VM, inside of a container, or really what it was more like is, what if we started with Kubernetes, which runs Docker, put a Docker container in there, that Docker container has Kimu, which is a, an, emulated, an emulator, and that inside of that has another Docker running, which inside of that has its own container that's running as a build engine. Uh, if you're not getting dizzy, uh, you're doing better off than I was when we first came up with this idea. And the idea was simply this. Right here at the VM layer, we can get a certain level of resource isolation that makes the Docker engine perfectly happy because it believes it owns the operating system. But between here and here, there's a kind of boundary that prevents a security escalation, an e a simple security escalation from breaking you all the way out and causing havoc on the rest of the system. So it seemed like a good idea and seemed like a bad idea at the same time. Here's what we discovered really to our shock. We wanted to run in full emulation mode rather than use KVM or something that would, that would um, leverage system resources because a lot of cloud providers will not allow you to do that. Uh, and so we wanted to make this so that you could deploy it into Amazon or uh, DigitalOcean or Azure and not have to worry about what the particular VM constraints were. We figured this was gonna add major overhead to build time. We were actually shocked to discover that it added a little, just a shade under 10% to the build time. And we're going, hey, when it comes to build time, I will gladly take 10% for the security isolation. Then it came to moving the built image off of the VM. That took us 40 minutes instead of two. And we went, hmm, that is not good. So we are still in the middle of this experiment. We are trying to figure out if we can achieve this kind of security model without uh, forcing the customer, or the, the application developer to wait 40 minutes to get their image back off of it. I'll keep you updated if we solve this problem. I know that uh, the Rancher has also gone down this path. I know they have a Git, GitHub project out there. And uh, we looked at it a little bit a few weeks back and I'd like to look at it again and see, uh, but I believe they're using KVM for it. All right, lesson. Number eight, the cluster bomb. Um, HA clustering is kinda hard. And it gets harder the more moving pieces you have in your network. And etcd has for us been the tool that has ended up being the case study in how to run good clusters. Uh, incidentally, before anybody thinks that I'm picking on etcd, a couple weeks ago I was at HashiConf and, uh, and listened to another guy give basically the same kind of talk about his trouble with console. Most of the things he had issues with there are the same kinds of things I had with etcd. The problem is you put these things in and they, be, and they become sort of a central component of the way you're orchestrating stuff, the way you're uh, lining up your logistics inside of your cluster. And when they tip over, bad things happen. Um, so we used etcd in sort of a naive way. Uh, we, we just kind of walked through the tutorial, figured out how it was working, used the discovery service, um, figured that, that, it was, that it could do a lot of the self-healing stuff on its own, and pushed it in. And that was sort of our first go at it. Uh, and over the last year or so, we have been learning lesson after lesson about how to really run at CD. And uh, you know, we would spend time, uh, here's, here's an example. I, don't, I could actually talk about this one for a really long time because we've done a lot of weird engineering stuff around this. But for example, we have a cluster of say three at CD nodes. As long as you've got three, and your voting algorithm works, and you have a, a, a suitable leader election, and something can keep writing, right? Uh, your write operations and your read operations will still work. If you lose one, you're down to two, uh, they, they can't elect one of them as the leader. And so they kind of lock up, and, and they wait around until you bring up a third one. Well, 
if the first one dies, it's still registered as one of the three peers. And when you bring up another one, it won't register as a new peer. It'll say, oh, there's already three peers. I'm gonna nominate myself as a, as a proxy. And so then it won't reach consensus again, but you'll have three running etcd nodes and they still won't be doing anything. And if you start up a fourth one, you'll end up in the same case because it still thinks it's got a cluster of three even though one is offline. And so over the course of examining how this works, um, we've had to figure out ways of actually uh, writing code that intervenes in that system and says, wait, is this node actually there or is it gone now? With Kubernetes, this has actually turned out to be fairly easy. We query the Kubernetes system and say, hey, the etcd cluster thinks that it has these three pods. Do you have three pods named this? And, uh, and Kubernetes says, no, this one's not here anymore. And then we go back to etcd and we remove it out. And then the next time we start one up, then it joins us up here and it resolves it. The bottom line, before I go on way too long about this, is that we discovered that with any of these clustering solutions, this is a place where you want to spend your time. And so we, we learned some hard lessons with etcd. We immediately went on and started working on Postgres with, in a sort of uh, flexible master minion sort of mode, where the traditional Postgres you stand up a master and you stand up a bunch of minions and the master replicates data out to the minions and the minions become basically read only. Um, and you can set it up a wide variety of ways, but we wanted to get it to the point where if the master fell over, one of the minions would get elected as a new master. This is not something that we found out a way to do natively in Postgres, though I wouldn't be surprised if somebody had cracked it. We ended up with a tool called Governor that used etcd to sort of track the state of various Postgres uh, instances and help us achieve that kind of thing. Uh, now we're on, so we've got that, that's out there in Deus slash Postgres. Now we're working on uh, React uh, and uh, one other, oh, we're working on Minio as well. So we're, we realized that really one thing we can add and really do a good job of is figuring out how to run uh, stable service clusters inside of the sort of volatile uh, environment that you get when you're running a containerized infrastructure. All right, lesson number seven. Um, Docker is a whale on the move. We made a mistake, and our mistake was to commit that we were gonna stay at the very tip of the Docker release cycle. So when Docker 1.5 came out, we'd switch right away to 1.5. When 1.6 came out, we'd switch right away to 1.6. And now we use Docker for a whole bunch of stuff, right? We're doing builds with it, we're, we're deploying containers with it, we run our own registry inside of Deus. Um, a lot of the stuff that Nick talked about, we run fairly similar architectures in, in the Deus cluster that they run in their CI CD system. But here's what we discovered. Um, every time we'd move to a new release, something surprising would happen. Something surprising would break because Docker doesn't really do Semver the way we expected them to. So when 1.5 goes to 1.6, the sort of semantic versioning scheme would indicate that uh, it, would be, it would be backward compatible, right? They wouldn't have broken anything or removed anything that was already there, or substantially changed something that was already there. Every single release, we found at least one uh, surprise that has caused us to sort of go back and rework sometimes fairly major portions of our code. The 1.11 release of Deus, uh, the, the brunt of our time doing development was to switch pieces of the infrastructure so that we could upgrade to Docker 1.8. Uh, and, and we've kind of backed off at this point and said, all right, is it worth staying right at the very edge in order to, you know, to encourage people, yeah, we're, we're always up to date on Docker? Or is it worth to hang back a little bit and sort of ride the back of that wave. And we've opted more for doing that because when you use Docker that deeply, uh, it, it feels safer <laughs> to do it that way. Um, and I understand why Docker is moving as fast as they are. It just ends up being frustrating for people like us who are trying to do fairly deep integrations with it and stay right on the cutting edge. Keeping with that nautical theme, lesson number six was to sink the Titanic while it's still in the harbor. Everybody's happier when they're not on the boat when it sinks. Um, testing is a very, very important part of what we do at this. Uh, we have a lot of people who are very passionate about the way that we do testing. 
we, uh, and, and I, I really can't say that our mistake was under testing these because we have worked very hard all along to test. Uh, but the platform increasingly gets more and more complex. Remember at the beginning I said what we really wanted to be able to provide was a way for uh, those who deploy it, the DevOps group who's working with it, we wanted to provide them a way of saying, you know what, uh, I don't want Ceph, I want Elastic Beanstalk. I don't, uh, I don't want to send my logs here, I want to send my logs here. Uh, I don't want, or, or I don't want any persistent storage anywhere on my cluster. We have actually done a number of installs that do that. So all these different components have to be very flexible, right? Because when you're, when you're not storing anything, you have to be very aware of what your current running state is. Whereas if you're storing stuff, you can get kind of lazy and push stuff out there. And the more flexibility we've tried to give to uh, those who are deploying Deus, the more complexity we're having to introduce into our own platform, which means the harder it has become to write tests. So we're, we're kind of in this state uh, of continually experimenting with different ways of testing. Uh, Kubernetes is gonna be an exciting one because we have a different method of being able to push things into an environment, seed the environment with certain information, run some tests on it, and then wipe the environment out in a very clean and reusable way. And so we're kind of excited to see what we can do there. But in the meantime, uh, we use Travis, we use Jenkins, we have uh, unit tests, we have functional tests, we have uh, acceptance tests, um, and we still actually do a pretty hefty dose of, uh, dose of manual testing just because the human error component when you're setting up a system this big is actually very revealing. You find some things that you just would not have thought were in there. Ideally, we'd like to get away from human testing all the way because it takes up time. Uh, but, but it's something that uh, the, those who are more passionate about testing than I am have pointed out time and time again, you know, we are gaining valuable insight from doing it this way. And until we're gaining that level of insight with other things, it is actually useful for us to collectively get together, spend a day spinning stuff up and tearing it down. So right now, the way we do it is all the other automated testing happens with just about every single commit, every, every um, push that we do into our GitHub repository. But a couple days before the release, between code freeze and production <laughs> release, we, uh, we'll, we'll take a day or two days and say, all right, here's a big spreadsheet of all the different setups we wanna test and just go sign up for the ones you wanna do. So a couple people will do DigitalOcean, a couple people will do Azure, a couple people will do AWS, and you just, do some test setups, run a couple of sample apps and see what happens. And inevitably, every single time we've done that, in spite of the fact that we have tons of automated tests, we have still found at least one or two bugs that our customers would have found otherwise. So, you know, so far, in spite of the old school nature of it, it has turned out to be a useful testing technique. All right, we're about halfway through the top 10 list here. Uh, gophers are awesome. How many of you have used Go before? Yeah, we, we like Go a lot. And there are, there are actually five things that I really, really love about working with Go on this particular kind of technology. One is that Go has some really great tooling. Uh, I, I remember um, picking up Java and going, uh, so I need the JDK, I need this build tool, I need this testing framework, I need this, I need this, I need this, just to, just to build sort of simple applications. And the Go developers put a lot of thought and effort into building a, a core tool chain that uh, is very flexible and provides for the, the vast majority of your needs. So you've got, of course, things like a compiler um, and a, a documentation generator, um, a formatting tool, a race detection tool. Um, you know, the list sort of goes on and you end up with this kind of robust set of tools. There's even one that, uh, that I love to play around with that will allow you to sort of write a regular expression-y sort of thing on the command line and refactor your code. And because it's syntax aware, it can do very clever things that your regular uh, greps and aux and seds do not do very well. Uh, so it's a good tool chain. It's a really strong tool chain and that makes my life as a developer much easier. Number two, and Nick had, a, had talked about this in the last one, you can compile Go down to binary. You can compile it down to a static binary that doesn't dynamically load anything, which is a fantastic fit for containers. Uh, we have we too experimented with scratch containers. We ended up with Alpine-based containers, 
So most of the Deus components run in Alpine 3.1 or 3.2. Uh, so they have little tiny uh, Linux images and then usually a Go binary and occasionally some shell scripts to help it bootstrap. Again, we're trying to move away from shell scripts and just go with Go. Uh, but it's a static binary. And so all together, you know, on a good day, we have sub 25 meg images. Um, and, and that's, you know, small Go, Small Go binaries running on a very small, minimal Linux guest. Go has a lot of rich libraries, and uh, you know the ecosystem is growing very rapidly. And we found some very, very high quality uh, third-party libraries. We use a lot of them. We use actually about seventy of them. Um, Go is also fairly easy to learn. People on our team have come from Ruby background, uh, Node.js background, Java, Python, uh, Clojure. Uh, so, and, and all of these people have sort of, this is their first or one of their very first Go projects. And uh, you know, I like to observe and see how quickly various people pick it up. And because the syntax is fairly simple, they tend to pick it up. Not all of them like it. The, the Clojure developer in particular it would prefer to be writing Clojure. Um, I, I can't, can't argue because I can't write Clojure. <laughs> Uh, but it, it does seem to be an easier language to pick up and learn and do. And for us, it is cross-platform in the sense that we need it to be cross-platform. Many of us work on OS 10 for our day-to-day -day lives and you can write your Go code in there. And with reasonable accuracy, if it'll compile and run on OS 10, it'll compile and run on Linux, which is our target. Um, there are a few very rare exceptions and each Subsequent Go release seems to fix some of those. There used to be issues with resolvers and things like that, but uh, largely we've had this experience that if we can run it on OS X, we can run it on Linux. But uh, we might have been just a little bit too starry-eyed about Go. In fact, you're probably going, wow, this guy's a total Go fanboy. Uh, and, and, and there are some issues with Go. And the ult ultimately we decided it's not worth switching off of Go. We like all of those advantages so much, there's no way we're gonna consider moving off of it. But there are a few things that just, ah, oh, just drive me crazy about Go. Um, one of them is, uh, this came from the Clojure developer. He says, look, you told me Go was easy. All you really meant was that Go has a really simple syntax because I'm writing a lot of code to do fairly repetitive things. And it's true, there are certain things in Go where because of the construction of the language, there is no compact way of doing it. Uh, the error handling method is great because it encourages you to the maximum extent to deal with the error in the context that the error occurs or to willfully pump that error back up. But there are some cases where it's like, oh, I'm writing yet another little if, if block to capture this error. It would be nicer if I could just uh, you know, declare my intent and have it take care of what I'm doing for me. Um, that actually is the Clojure developer's biggest pet peeve with Go. Like, can't it just throw something? I just wanted to throw something. I thought he was gonna throw something. <laughs> now, the, the next problem is package management followed closely by package management and also package management. We had a really rough discovery a couple of days ago and that was that GoDeps was essentially hiding the fact from us that we had four different versions of the exact same package uh, being pulled in. And we don't know which one ended up getting pulled in finally. Uh, we've, it's probably the first one that it found. Uh, but we don't know what the ramifications of that are. Because if four different libraries said they needed this thing, but they pinned it to a particular version, the only way for us to figure out which version is the version is to go back manually uh, through the Git history of each of those and see what's changed and then look at all the source code that calls it and figure out if there's something in there that's actually important or that it just happened to be the version that got pinned when somebody ran Godot's. Um, and we've, you know, there, there are other issues we've run into where uh, packages like Kubernetes uh, has, Kubernetes has around 100 dependencies. I think it's, it, it really fluctuates depending on various, in fact, depending on the commit. Um, but that's a lot, we have 70. So it's not quite 170 because we, we share some in common, but that's a lot of dependencies to manage. And when you discover you can't really trust the dependency resolution of your system, you start going, wait, are, are we building a time bomb or, uh, or, or can we safely ignore this? Uh, do we just ignore it until something blows up? Or do we try and build some tooling? 
Um, I've been working on another package manager for Go um, called Glide and have been trying to solve this problem and it is hard. It is a very difficult problem to solve and I've done it at least three wrong ways. So, um, <laughs> but that is, it is a big challenge for us and it is, I would say, really the number one issue we've had with Go. Uh, those, those of you who complain about Go not having generics, I, you, will, you will find no sympathy in me. I, I just don't care. But <laughs> that is another one that you'll hear frequently from. Okay, where is this one going, right? Uh, your team is like your underpants. Anybody want to guess? No, please don't guess. Uh, they can really only stretch so far. Now, I'm not going to lecture on management because I'm not qualified for that. But I will talk about microservices. Does anybody recognize this picture? Ready this Player One. Ready Player One, that's right. In the book Ready Player One, the main character grows up in this thing called the Stacks, am I right? Um, where essentially, they're, they're like, it's a trailer park uh, organized sort of vertically, right? And so you got an Airstream on top of uh, you know, Winnebago and they're just kind of stacked up. Some are new and shiny, some are old and crusty, but they're just compacted into this one large space. This to me is my mental image of microservices. You got a whole bunch of things. They're kind of repetitive in the sense that they all have the same kind of structure and everything like this. Uh, but each one's individual and unique and some are beautiful and some are ugly and some are about to tip over and others are fairly robust. I really don't think you should stack something like that on top of something like that, but you know. Um, our biggest pain point in learning how to do microservices right it has been a people problem. It has been this. Um, I'm gonna work on the etcd microservice. He's gonna work on the Postgres one and he's gonna work on the builder one. So now we've got three people working on three different microservices. Well, it's not really a good idea to have each of us working in isolation, but I'm too busy to help him, he's too busy to help me. Uh, how do you develop 12 microservices with a team of eight or whatever your actual numbers are? Um, and and, and wh what worries us is that everyone will be working on their little set of services and believe that they're achieving the mission and then we get to the Titanic part where we try and run our tests and things blow up. And one guy says, well, it's not my fault. I built it exactly the way that I described it to you. And the other guy says, well, it's not, not my fault. I mean, this is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. How do, you over, how do you accommodate that? Second issue, how do you accommodate the bus factor, right? If one of us leaves on vacation, does that mean that person's microservices get abandoned for a couple of weeks and the rest of us just cope with it? This is one of those rare cases where, uh, where the best solution for us has been to introduce actual people process into it. Uh, if any of you have ever participated on Go's issue queue, either filing an issue or, or uh, sending a PR or something like that, you will notice that we discuss things a lot and then we LGTM things, looks good to me. Um, we label up, we actually have little GitHub labels, LGTM1, LGTM2. The idea behind this is that we actually want to make sure that at least two other people have looked at every single line of code that goes into Deus, any of the microservices, anything like that. Um, there are a few reasons for this. One is the obvious case where I am often myopic and blind to my own dumb errors, right? And, and Kent and Kirith and my colleagues who are sitting here are often better at noticing the errors I have in my code than I am because I'm thinking in a very specific mindset while they're going, what does this do? I that just opened a new issue. <sighs> that's it, out you go. No. <laughs> Wait, I, I meant that's a feature, not a bug. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, that's a really good dynamic to have. The other is that you ensure that everybody's seeing the code and picking it up as you go. And the third is that it keeps you all on the same page because when I understand what he's doing and he understands what I'm doing, then, uh, then there are m fewer surprises when we get to that integration point and, and I say, all right, here's my piece, and he says, here's my piece. It has been tough with microservices to do this. And admittedly, I have argued against this on occasion going, this is so frustrating. I cannot get two people to LGTM this for me. I can't, I can't even get one person to read the code for me. And mainly it has come down to the process of bribery. Chocolate, cookies, coffee, milkshakes. No, and, and, and you know, expressing to other people in actual friendly human language, look, I really need somebody to take a look at this code. We have also sort of gone, uh, added some process and said, <coughs> ideally everybody should spend X number of minutes each morning 15 maybe 
uh, trying to go through uh, the other issue queues and PR things. Uh, I'm worse about that than others, but I have you know, one colleague, Matt Borsma, we will, and, and actually Matt Fisher, there are a lot of Matts in days, both phenomenal at going through every morning and clearing through PRs. If it weren't for them, uh, a lot of LGTMs wouldn't happen. And in consequence, um, they tend to know a whole lot about the big picture view of how Deus is working. All right, we are down to number three. All your schedulers are belong to us. Um, which could also be titled, Somebody Set Us Up the Bomb. So here was our idea with Deus version one. If, if you didn't get the reference, I'm sorry, I'm old. Um, in Deus version one, we had this great idea. Look, uh, we've discovered that people like different uh, file system backends. We've discovered people like to do logging differently. Um, we've discovered that the Heroku build pack thing is really popular because people pick different languages. Here's an idea. There's Fleet, there's Swarm, there's Nomad, there's uh, Kubernetes, there's Mesos, Marathon. How about if we support them all? And so we kind of did. We actually worked to the point where we had preview releases Fleet, of course, was the scheduling tool we used for Deus v1 uh, when we started it. We added Swarm support, we added uh, Mesos support, we added Kubernetes support, and then the pattern emerged. Uh, support all of the schedulers really turned out to mean support the weakest scheduler. And not the weakest individual scheduler, but like the weakest parts of the, the sort of union of weakest pieces. So if one scheduler is excellent at handling volumes and another one is excellent at scheduling resources, you lose both of those because one's weak at scheduling resources and one's weak at managing volumes. So instead, you have to accommodate a weak volume managing, weak uh, resource usage tracking scheduler. And the farther we got down this road, the more we went, well, this kind of sucks because here we've got a really high powered scheduler and a low powered scheduler and we're developing a sort of wrapper that makes it even weaker than, than those two. So we had a really tough couple of days where we said, all right, what are we gonna do? Uh, we had just released the Kubernetes preview release. Um, we were getting good feedback from that one. We were comparing it with feedback we had for the other schedulers. We were looking at what we thought had the most uh, likelihood to succeed and met our current needs. And we got, first of all, narrowed it down to two. We had Mesos, we had Kubernetes. Uh, Mesos' uh, flexibility ruled it out because we realized we can always run Kubernetes inside of Mesos. And so we ended up picking, um, uh, picking Kubernetes as our scheduler. It did what we wanted and we realized once we did that, we could really kind of dive deeply into Kubernetes and take advantage of its secrets management, its volumes management, uh, its service discovery, and, and so on. And so that's what we did. That incidentally is the reason why, if any of you are wondering why, why Swarm and, uh, and Mesos and stuff like that aren't getting updated, that's why. All right, this one I might have gone a little overboard. Mono repos are evil. Okay, mono repos aren't exactly evil, uh, but they have some pros and they have some cons. The pros are that all the code's in one place. Uh, everyone gets alerted on everything and it simplifies the build process, the documentation project, there's only one issue queue, but the cons were uh, the, as the code got bigger and bigger and bigger, the develop each individual developer had more and more and more <coughs> things they had to be able to accommodate on their development workstation. And, and yeah, the, the, then there's the everyone gets alerted on everything. It's a good idea when you think of it in terms of keeping the team together. It's a bad idea when you realize you're getting notified about things you really don't care about at all. Um, and then we had the problem where stable and preview features got mixed because everything got committed into the same repo. And then came the real sort of clencher for us. We realized that we were telling all of our app developers, develop microservices. And we were saying internally, we're gonna develop microservices. But in order to get all of our microservices, you had to download this giant massive repository. So even if you only wanted one small slice of the pie, you had to download the entire pie, get all the dependencies, get it all up and running, and then pick the things you wanted. Ultimately, what it came down to was, we could not justify as an open source platform that had made big promises to be friendly and, and good open source. Uh, we couldn't justify the fact that we were then uh, burdening the, our, our users with the idea that they had to sort of buy into our mono repo philosophy even if they just wanted a piece here or a piece there. So while we thought one repo with everything in it was a good idea, hey, you know, Google does it, um, we realized 
and it was a tough realization that we needed to really start breaking down. So if you look at our GitHub account, you will notice that in the last couple of months, we have gone from only Deus slash Deus to Deus Rigor, Deus Etcd, Deus Postgres, Deus Ryak, all of these other projects. All right, we're up to the last one. Uh, lesson number one, and I alluded to this several times already, Kubernetes floats my boat, but it's a very big and complex boat. You see, we thought that we were simplifying things by picking just one scheduler, but then of course, you have to sort of dive all the way into that one scheduler. And Kubernetes has its own vocabulary uh, and its own conceptual framework, its own way of looking at things. There are sort of, you can sort of have uh, Kubernetes bifocals, right? You can look at one layer and see the manifest with pods and replication controllers and services, or you can you know, look down through the other side of the bifocals and see the kublets and the kube proxies and the, um, <coughs> and the, uh, the heapster and the C advisors and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and, and it gives everybody, so it's sort of like a jarring experience the first time that they encounter this. And so in order to get all of the developers ramped up, we basically did it this way. The guys who worked on the initial preview release of Kubernetes began educating some of us about how Kubernetes worked. And then we started educating other people. We signed up for classes. We tried to pair up people who understood it with people who didn't. Uh, and one of the things that came out of this is there is a huge opportunity with Kubernetes. So there's Kubernetes, right? Let's, let's, this is the line. Beneath the line is all of the service stuff in Kubernetes. There's the kubelet, uh, there's the, the uh, kube proxy, there's all the orchestration layer that's going on underneath the hood. Now, <coughs> this is great, it's fascinating stuff, but we don't really need to deal with that space unless something's wrong. Most of the time, what we're interested in are the things that we're putting on top of Kubernetes that we're deploying out into the world. And there's a separate set of concepts for those. There are pods and services and replication controllers. If you've heard uh, Kelsey Hightower talk about this, he's got some excellent presentations that are all available online. Um, there's not a lot of tooling. There's a lot of tooling for dealing with this part. There's not a lot of tooling for dealing with this part. And so ultimately, in on route to building Deus V2, we realized, well, there's an opportunity to t sort of contribute into the Kubernetes space by building some useful tools. And so over the last week, we have started talking a little bit about this tool called Helm, where our idea was, assuming you've got a Kubernetes cluster running somewhere, we wanted to streamline that process where you had to copy and paste manifests down from the Kubernetes website and try and edit them, tinker around with them, try them, see if they work, uh, bring them back down, try them, tweak them a little bit. We wanted to make it feel like homebrew, where you type in a command and it installs it in there. And you're pretty sure that when you type brew install whatever, you're gonna get a working application. We wanted to do that with Kubernetes, so we wrote a tool called Helm. Kubernetes, by the way, means captain, and Helm is, you know, the steering wheel. Uh, we thought we were clever. Um, so assume you want a Redis cluster, right? The idea was we wanted to provide a tool where you type in Helm install Redis cluster. And it spins up a Redis cluster into Kubernetes. Now if you want to tweak it, we copy all those files locally. You can tweak the files and then reinstall it uh, and be up and running with a Redis cluster. You don't have to go through that process of running the first pass through picking an image and trying to write all the manifests and build the services and do all of that. That's done by the community and tested for you just like any package management solution. And it gets you, sometimes it'll get you 100% of the way there. We're shooting for something like 80, where we get it to the point where all you need to do is go in and customize it. So that's what I really wanted to talk about today. We've learned some tough lessons. Uh, we feel like we've stayed pretty true to the guiding philosophy that we set out with, right? That containers are ideal for microservices and that we can use that to sort of start getting over the throwing it over the wall. But along the way, we've learned a lot of stuff about good ways to cluster, good ways to tool, good ways to test. Uh, and, and the bottom line for us is we think that even though uh, the new hotness today is a little different from the new hotness from yesterday, we're on the right trajectory, heading up a wave that has yet to crest, and we've got some really cool technologies that we can play with. All right, thank you guys very much. I don't know if I have any time for questions. Do I have a minute or two? Uh, yeah. All right. Precisely. Yep. Uh, work, uh, testing related question. Uh, how do you feel about regression testing? Do you guys cover that at all in the data? How do we feel about regression testing? <laughs> we do, at unit levels, we do some regression testing. Um, oftentimes, those kinds of cases become part of our functional testing suite, but 
we, that is one of the areas we have not done a good job of formalizing. And one of the things we're battling, um, and Nick and I had this long talk about this yesterday, you want the most robust testing system you can build without having to do a lot of work. And it's that last part that's a pain. <laughs> I work for Hertz and I'm trying to accomplish that as well. Yeah. If, yeah, if anybody finds a silver bullet for that problem, I will pay you a lot of money. Yeah? Uh, so since you guys converged on uh, Kubernetes, I'm curious if you guys are using um, its uh, DNS service discovery add-on, and also did you guys come up with any lessons with respect to service discovery? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. So the question was what we learned about service discovery from Kubernetes. There are two ways to do service discovery in Kubernetes. One of them is through DNS. Uh, the other one is through environment variables. So uh, when you declare a service in Kubernetes, it will automatically notify the DNS server, hey, there's a service running at this host on this port, uh, and, and sometimes, and it has these, these names, right? So you can say there's this port named HTTP is actually listening on 8080 on host uh, 10.2177.2. Um, and the DNS resolver will handle that for you. So then your app just has to go, hey, give me the service named this listening on HTTP, on the port named HTTP. The other uh, route they provide is through environment variables. Here's what we sort of come away with. We want to be able to deploy on the maximum number of Kubernetes clusters we can. Not everybody chooses to enable SkyDNS. So we have been, to the, to the greatest extent possible, we've been using environment variables for setup. The downside is they're static. Once the pod comes up, those environment variables don't change. So in other cases, we've gone with the DNS, we've started looking at the DNS, and we've started looking at whether it just makes more sense to run etcd in cluster. Uh, and we're we, it, right now we're kind of on a case by case trying to figure out what the best practice is there. But that's what we've come up with. Here's your tile. Uh, I guess we're gonna wrap up. <coughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much. Have a good day.